Good morning, Southwest. How y'all doing today? It's good to see you. Thank you so much for being with us to worship the name of Jesus Christ. Some of you may be new to us, and I want you to know that that is the heartbeat of our church, Jesus Christ, in him crucified, but risen again. This is our testament this day. Jesus is the hope of the world. And if you don't know him, uh, we encourage you today to consider uh, vesting in a relationship with Jesus that will not only give you uh, peace on this earth, but eternal rest in the next. This is the good news of the gospel. And if you've come to hear that good news, I should think that you have come to the right place. We got a few things to commemorate and honor and celebrate and remind you of. Then we're going to get to God's uh, word here in just a moment. Um, I would be remiss were not to remind us that on tomorrow, at some point, I should hope we will join uh, in the fanfare of a grateful nation as we uh, commemorate the legacy of the Reverend Dr. Martin Luther King Jr. On um, tomorrow, we will pause and we will say thank you, Lord, for having sent not only him, but a cadre of men and women, boys and girls who dared believe that these promises that are embedded in our Constitution, that all men are created equal, uh, would truly be realized for every nook and cranny of our society. And I, for one, am so glad. Amen to that. And I, for one, am so glad to be a part of a church where it just doesn't matter what you look like, act like, think like, or vote like, as long as your faith be in Christ, we ought to be able to get along. And everybody said amen to that. Um, we want to remind you, uh, if you are new to us, you would have been, I think, given one of these prayer cards. Uh, if you weren't here last weekend, we asked our people to uh, partner with us and I'm being a little selfish in my own prayer life. I'm asking you to fill this out so that I personally can know how to pray for you throughout the year. In fact, every morning, I'm starting off my morning going through about 10 or 12 of these. Uh, God has anointed some of your handwriting. I didn't know that some of you uh, know other languages and you write uh, in Hebrew and Sanskrit and other dead languages, but I'm working my way through it. Next year, we will get these typed up in Jesus' name, um, but I'm having a joy walking through those. So if you're here today, and um, I'd just love to partner with you and pray with you over the year, to be quite honest, um, you help a preacher preach, you help a pastor pastor. Uh, if I can carry the weights with you, that's kind of something uh, for me. So drop these off, fill it out today, drop it off on your way out, and I'll be praying for you uh, throughout the year. Uh, we've got a marriage event called Cultivate Date Night coming up on uh, Tuesday night. The information's coming up on screen. Uh, if you got you a boo thing, or if you said I do to a boo thing, okay? African-American colloquialism, meaning you are betrothed, okay? You're married, you're wed. Uh, we just believe in the institution of marriage and we wanna keep marriages encouraged. And we have hired, get this, something called a gospel illusionist. No, we don't know what that means either. But we hear that he is amazing and he has entertained couples for decades. Guys, we're gonna have childcare and we're gonna have all the bells and whistles. We're gonna have a lot of fun Tuesday night. So check out the information uh, because how many of you know in marriage, when you're in the dating phase, sometimes you oversell it and sometimes they oversell it and then you get into that thing and you wish you could take it back to the store. Can I get a... Some of y'all can't say, man, your return item is right next to you, but that's a whole nother, that's a whole, but, so, but if you're not careful, you just oversell stuff. Uh, there's a story told of a woman who falls in love with this fella, and of course she goes to tell mom, mom, I found the man of my dreams. Well, the mom says, well, is he Catholic? Because we're Catholic. And the girl says, well, mom, he's not Catholic. She says, oh, no, 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 you're not marrying anyone unless he is Catholic, so you better get to work getting him converted and so she gets to work on her boyfriend, and she's taking him through catechism, and they're doing the communion stuff, and he finally relents and says, okay, I'll become Catholic. And it seems like everything is honky-dory. She's getting ready for her big wedding day, and she's just excited because she sold him on Catholicism. Well, about a week before the wedding, she's distraught. She comes to her mom, and she's just crying and snotting and tearing up. And she says, mama... <laughs> I don't think it's going to happen. I don't think I'm going to be able to marry this man. She says, what do you mean you're not going to be able to marry? He became Catholic. You sold him on the faith. What happened? She says, Mom, he's thinking about becoming a priest. Sometimes you can oversell. 
Anyways, the Jokes Tuesday will be way better than that, I promise. But uh, uh, married couples, we hope that you will avail yourself to that. I got a lot of fish to fry, and I've burned up most of my time uh, to fry it, but perhaps God has a word uh, for us. If you have your Bibles, would you meet me in 2 Peter chapter 1, verses 16 through 21. 2 Peter chapter 1, verses 16 through 21. Did y'all appreciate the worship team? Did you listen? Did you... Did you like that Amazing Grace song? They wrote that. That is a Southwest song for Southwest. Can we give it up for our worship team and, and thank God for them? Isn't that cool? Uh, so if you're new to us, we've been in a series called Rhythms, Proven Practices for the New Year. And the whole idea comes from Matthew 6, You remember this? Jesus says, seek first the kingdom of God and his righteousness, all the things will be added to you. And one of the things we've been um, uh, just kind of establishing as truth for us is that in the kingdom, you're not called to make things your goal, but you're called to make kingdom your goal. And Jesus says, when you make me your goal, have you noticed that when you make Jesus the goal, the things kind of find you? Come on, somebody. Instead of you having to go after the things. So that's what we mean when we say rhythms. And so we're trying to bring an answer to this question. What are those biblical, foundational, tried and true, key word, rhythms for life in the gospel? In other words, what is your home? What is your home base? What do you just need to keep doing rhythmically and concertedly in your life that will bring about spiritual strength and renewal? That's kind of where we're going with the whole idea of this. Rhythms are greater than resolutions. Rhythms are greater than resolutions. So we talked about the first rhythm, which is do good. And the lesson was this. It is better that you see your life as one who blesses. It is better. It is more fulfilling for you. It is more It is more contentment for you when you see yourself as a bless or. It is better to give than it is to receive. So what does it mean to be on the lookout, to be a blessing in the lives of other people? It makes life better. Uh, last weekend, remember this one? Second rhythm, move on, okay? Don't you dare let the past of your life hold you back from your future. Jesus parted Red Seas, raised up a dead Lazarus, crumbled Jericho's walls. Surely he can move you past the tumult of your past. You got to learn how to move on because Jesus is bigger than that. Today I'm going to talk to you about the most important thing I'm going to ever talk to you about. It's the third rhythm, and it's this read your Bible. Read your Bible. Read your Bible. Friends, I've always said it this way. How many of us want a great relationship with God? Okay, this is where everyone can participate, you know. That's why you don't say, who wants a terrible relationship with God? You know, no, who wants a great relationship with God? Well, one of the things Scripture teaches is that if you do desire a great relationship with God, just have a good relationship with your Bible. Because at the end of the day, the book is God's expressed love letter and will and purpose for your life. God speaks to you. But how many of you know that 99.99999% of the time, the way God has ordained to speak to you and move you in your life is through his holy word. It's all about the Bible. Now, this here is a Bible church, okay? But we're hoping that our people can be Bible people. Because can you imagine what change this valley is going to experience if every last one of us became a consistent Bible reader? Folks, I'm telling you, everybody in the valley going to get saved up in here, up in here. I'm telling you, if everybody here becomes a Bible reader, I'm telling you, everybody going to be trying to come live up in the desert because the fire of revival, they're already trying to come live up in our desert, okay? And it is what it is. Not you who have moved here. You're, you're, you're our friends, but everybody else, we really just kind of want to keep it to ourselves. But the whole idea is that when we get in God's word, we get in God's heart. And that's what God has for us. We are 2,000 years ago. We are probably 25 or so years on the other side of the resurrection. Um, they used to call him sock breath because Peter was the apostle who always put his foot in his mouth. 
But when we read the passage, it has seen that 25 years have matured him. We think he's a couple of years away from being himself crucified as Jesus said he would be. So we think we're just months, maybe a year or two away from the moment where legend says they will walk him up another hill where there will be a cross awaiting for him. But as they get ready to nail Peter's hands to the cross, And he notices that is upright. He begs his executioner, will you please turn my cross upside down so that as I die, I will die upside down because I'm so enamored by him, I don't even deserve to die the same way he did. He's captured a wonderful episode for us. And he writes to us these words here. Now the word of the Lord. Peter's writing, for we did not follow cleverly devised myths When we made known to you the power and coming of our Lord Jesus Christ, but we were eyewitnesses of his majesty. For when he received honor and glory from God the Father, and the voice was born to him by the majestic glory, what language? This is my beloved son with whom I am well pleased. We ourselves heard this very voice born from heaven, for we were with him on the holy mountain. Look at verse 19, it is key. And we have the prophetic word more fully confirmed to which you will do well, to key phraseology, pay attention. As to a lamp shining in a dark place until the day dawns and the morning star rises in your hearts, knowing this first of all, that no prophecy of scripture comes from someone's own interpretation. For no prophecy was ever produced by the will of man. I love this phrase, would you look at it with me? Some of the most important words in your Bible. But men spoke from God as they were carried along by the Holy Spirit. 2 Peter chapter 1, verses 16 through 21. Don't you know? I've read from the greatest book ever written. I bear witness this day that all of his words are true. Amen? Amen. 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 Let's go ahead and get to it. That could have been very bad, um, but we survived. Anyways, what I want to do before we jump into the thick of the passage is kind of tell you what this sermon is not. Because when you say, I'm going to preach on the Bible, all you theologues and all you nerds and all you geeks, you start doing this. I already see you now. (laughs) What is he going to do with this? And already you think you have to be all things to all people with 10 minutes that you have left for a sermon. And so what I want to do is kind of quell some of the expectations to make sure you know where I'm going so you won't be uh, frustrated with where I am not going. Because how many of you know to talk about the glorious truths surrounding the doctrine of Scripture, we ain't got the 17 months that it takes. We only got about 17 minutes. So this is the things I want to do. The first thing I want to remind you is that the good news is that this is not a guilt message. And everybody said... Amen. It is not lost on me that every last one of us, including me, could stand to read some more of the Bible. And I don't know about you, but I've never been motivated by guilt. I've never been motivated by shame. The only thing guilt and shame has produced in my soul is a performance spirit instead of a glad Jesus has performed for me spirit. I've sat in too many sermons where the preacher beat me upside the head and made me feel terrible that I wasn't even a child like God and everything else in between. And you ain't got to shout, but I'm going to shout. This is not a guilt church. This is not a shame church. We love you, God loves you, and let's just encourage one another to keep on keeping on. You ain't going to say amen, but somebody should have said amen right there. This is not a guilt message. Secondly, this is not in all there is to know about the Bible message. This is not exhaustive, okay? We are not going to nearly broach all of the the theological, all of the all of the philosophical, all of the methodological territory surrounding the truths of Scripture. So you may have some questions about Scripture. We're not going to be able to answer them all today. If you have the Southwest app, one of the things we did do is embed a link with a video from me telling you, if you're new to the Bible, here's some key steps for you to start reading it. And I've put probably too many links of podcasts and articles that will answer all your nerdy, wonderful questions that are worthy of our time. And so this may be disappointing to some because we're not 
going to be able to answer every question, worthy questions like, Ricky, who, who wrote the Bible? Okay, who are they? What's their resume? Can I get whether or not they had the credibility? Uh, who decided what gets into the Bible? How did they go, come about that decision? How did they decide what got get in the Bible? Who said that? Who then did? Do I know them? Had, had, let me know who they are. I need to know what happened. How did they get in the Bible? Who, 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 who did they pray and fast first to make sure to see what happens in the Bible? How do I know? Ricky, how many manuscripts do you Christians have? I know how many the Islamists have. I know how many the Buddhists have. I know how many the Hindu folks have. How many manuscripts do the Christians have? Because I want to know. We ain't got time for all that, okay? Check the articles later. But there are worthy questions that we can't answer. Ricky, what's up with you Christians? How do you guys get to get away with circular logic and circular reasoning? How do you guys get to proclaim the truths of Scripture on the truths of Scripture? How do you get to connect your logic to your actual logic? Oh, well, I would, if I had the time, I'd tell you that's called the thought theology of first principles, which means you have to espouse your first principles and some linkage to your actual first principles. It's the only way that it works. So don't quit saying that the church is the ones who do that because all of you do that, you secularists, you. You scientists refer to science to espouse your science. You rationalists refer to your rationality to espouse to your ration. You people, you philosophies, refer to philosophy to purport your philosophy. So at the end of the day, understand this. Yes, we have some extent of circular logic. Here's our conviction. This is supreme authority. And so we celebrate supreme authority by basing it on supreme authority. And if we go to any other authority, if we believe this is supreme authority, to go to another authority is by definition a lesser authority. So excuse us if we use the book to talk about the book, because the only way we know the truth is through the book. So we celebrate the truth with the book. You better ask somebody up in here, up in here, we believe this book is true. We ain't got time to talk about all that. Okay? So there's other worthy questions. Ricky, which version should I read? Should it be a New American Standard Bible? Should it be a King James Version? Should it be English Standard Revised Version? Ricky, I don't know. You're always talking about Greek words. Should I go learn Greek for two years and then read the Bible in Greek? Should I learn Hebrew? Should I learn that Sanskrit? Ricky, I don't know what I should do. Ricky, I don't know. They came out with a new emoji version. Should I take out the emoji version? <laughs> That's really a thing. There's an emoji Bible. I don't know. Ricky, I'm new to faith. I really want to buy a Bible. Should I buy a leather bound Bible? Or should I save a cow and get one that's made out of vinyl? But if I get one made out of vinyl, will that mess up the environment. I don't know what to do with them. Worthy questions. We ain't got time for all that. Amen. Okay. What this is, friends, is just an encouragement message. That's all this is. We're encouraging you that if you read your Bible, your life will change. If you read your Bible, your marriage will be blessed. If you read your Bible, your career will be blessed. If you read and do what your Bible says, you'll have more money. Oh, now we awake. <laughs> there are principles in God's word that he's designed life to operate by that some of us are missing out because we don't get on the word. And as we go to the text, this is the encouragement I really want to give you. When you read your Bible, it won't just bless you. It'll bless the people coming after you. You reading your Bible will bless your children and their children and their children and their children, amen? Um, here's a picture of um, my mama and us as kids. My mama's in heaven, and the lady with the jerry curl in the middle, that's my mama. To the left, now I'm Junior, I'm Richard Junior, so that's Junebug on the left. That's my brother Jock on the right. Now the baby in the middle that looks like he's had some bad fish, um, that's my brother, that's my, that's my brother Jay. And uh, this is my mama's Bible. Um, I always say if my house catches on fire, uh, you know, I don't have favorites, but I'm getting that girl out first. <laughs> then I'm getting those boys out. Then I'm getting my wife out. And <laughs> those are your directions, no? No? Leave that alone? Okay, we got to go to Cultivate Show Enough now, Tuesday night? Okay. Um, <laughs> But even if I had $100,000 at my house, and I do not, but even if I did, I'd come after this Bible. I'm saved today because she read that book. Uh, this is... Um, do we have the picture of my, me and granddad? I forgot it at the last service. This is... Uh, 
It's my grandfather. And this is about 15, this is 60th, right? It's about 15 years ago, proving that I can be thin. Um, my granddad is a pastor, and he's 89. And in a couple of weeks, he'll be 90. And as he is wont to say, Ricky, the old man's getting out of here. And a couple of weeks ago, he sent me a box, Dwayne, um, with all of his favorite books. And um, this is his Bible from 1976. And uh, when I'm gone, it's your job to give it to Camden. And it'll be Camden's job to give it to his oldest and so on and so forth. Because don't you know, the only reason I'm sitting on this stage today because that man faithfully read this book. Brother and sister, you're going to have children and grandchildren and people you influence that someday are going to be somewhere telling your story. That because you believed in what God has said to you in this word, it's going to change you people even after you are gone. Get in this book. Amen? Three encouragements. We don't have much time. When we come to the passage, I think one of the things Paul, Peter is saying is that the word of God is precious. Everybody say precious. Okay, not Lord of the Rings precious, but <laughs> the Holy Spirit precious. We're not saying the Bible the precious. No, we're saying the, the Holy Spirit, this insp- Spirit-inspired book is precious. We're in 2 Peter, and when you come to 2 Peter, I need you to think um, glory. Okay, I think that's the theme of 2 Peter. Now, When you come to 2 Peter, think glory. Now, when you say glory, don't say it like you guys say it. You got to say it like an elderly African-American church mother from Mississippi, okay? When you guys say glory, this is how you say it. Glory. (laughs) Glory. (laughs) Hum-de-dum, hum-de-dum, glory. Okay, it's beautiful. But when Peter says it, I think he says it like they did. And this is how they say it. Glory. Y'all see that girth of glory from the diaphragm, glory. And my point is this. When you read the passage, you cannot help but be taken aback by how much Peter is taken aback by the glory of his Savior. Our passage mentions majesty twice. It mentions glory twice. It says holy once. It says divine once. I, I had so much joy in my heart to reading over 2 Peter this week, and page after page, the jots and tittled are filled with what seems to be in the apostle's heart and mind, an enamoredness with the immensity, glory to God, and the wonder and the splendor of God. He seems to be, he is not, but he seems to be consumed with this notion of Jesus coming back. In fact, in our passage, he mentions it, and he mentions it several times in the passage. Chapter 3, verse 10, he says, Behold, church, Jesus is coming like a thief in the night. Chapter 3, verse 12, he says, Behold, it is we now who are waiting and hastening the coming day of God. His point is this, church, wake up and get your heart right. Jesus is coming. And it is your responsibility to be ready when he comes. And I know this is the kind of preaching that empties churches and doesn't pack them, but I declare it packs heaven. Get your heart right. Give your life to Jesus Christ before it's everlasting too late. There is glory in this passage, and his point is this. Because Jesus is coming, he's saying, uh, notice the progression. He's saying, pay attention to God's word. Now, here's the point. He says in verse 16, He says that we have not uh, followed cleverly devised myths, but he's moving on. And his point is this. I have not staked my reputation on a fairy tale. I have not risked my whole last 30 years on hearsay. I've not risked eternity on something that is man-made or made up. But he says in the verse, he says, I was an eyewitness of his majesty. Notice verse 18. He says, for we were with him on his old holy mountain. What is Peter saying? He's saying, guys, I was there when Jesus was transfigured. Matthew chapter 17. Jesus had walks up with Peter, James, and John up to the mountain. And the Bible says he is transfigured figure before them. All of a sudden, Moses appears, and Elijah appears to encourage Jesus just before he lays down his life, before the foundation of the world. The Bible says he was Greek word metamorpho, 
which is metamorphosis, which means he was changed. The idea is that for a moment, Jesus took off his human raiment and allowed them to have a glimpse into his divine raiment. What this means is that the Shekinah glory of the Holy One of Israel was now adorning Jesus. Jesus was glowing like a 1970s disco ball before them. And Peter says, I saw him as he is coming back, and I know for myself that he is God. Now, notice the progression further still, because he says, not only did I see him, but I heard the voice of God authenticating that moment, saying, this is my beloved son in whom I am well pleased. Can you imagine what our ears will feel when we see God in glory and we hear the word of the creator in our ears, Peter said, I got a preview of coming attractions. I heard his voice. But no, now right on the third heading home, notice the focus of the passage. Because Peter now spends the bulk of the passage saying what has been more worth of more spiritual worth to him even than seeing Jesus and hearing the voice of God. Here's the pit thrust of the text. Hear it, and I hope you get this. Peter's saying, look, I saw him. Peter says, look, I heard him. But let me tell you what's been keeping me for 30 years, this book. Let me tell you what's been guiding me for 30 years, this book. Let me tell you what's kept me out of trouble, this book. Let me tell you how I stay encouraged this book. What's the lesson? Could he be suggesting that even reading the Bible is better than having a glimpse of Jesus himself? That seems to be the argument of the text because he says we have the prophetic word more fully confirmed. What's the lesson, y'all? The Bible should be precious to us. It should be precious to you. God has seen fit to give you a love letter to let you know what he thinks about you so you won't believe what Satan says about you. God has given you a love letter to correct your wrongs when you get out of line, to be a blessing to you. The government doesn't put speed limit signs to be angry at us. I don't know. Sometimes, though, I think they do. But anyways, <laughs> the whole idea is that if everybody disobeyed, didn't have the speed limit signs and went whatever they did and did whatever they want to, there would be chaos. That's how you need to see the Bible. God has graced us with a speed limit sign, with a yield sign, with a red light or a green light or a yellow light to make sure that there's not chaos in your life. This is what it means to adhere your heart to the Word of God. The Word of God is precious, but let's be real. It ain't precious anymore. It's not precious anymore. Um, Gallup just did a poll, and the poll said, although Americans continue to revere the Bible, it has become quite obvious they no longer read it. And as such, we are among the nation's first generation of biblical illiterates. They did a survey that discovered that fewer than 50% of all adults can name the four Gospels. 60% of American Christians cannot name five of the Ten Commandments. Sorry, guys. 82% of Americans believe God helps those who help themselves is a Bible verse. <laughs> and the point is this. We don't know the Bible. It is no longer precious to us, and we've got to reverse that. I went to China the first time in 2010, and it was a missions trip to train underground church pastors, and so uh, I can't tell you where we were to protect our brethren over there, but we were hiding out and, and on the run from the commies. It was so much fun. And so I almost got arrested like three times, you know, just ducking out. And, and so we literally go to a hideout. It's a compound. It's an it's abandoned apartment building, like three stories. Our missions raised enough money for all of these pastors who were day laborers to not have to worry about work for three days so they can safely be with us while we train them as men and women, house churches, most of whom have been beaten for being pastors, have been arrested for being pastors. And I'm telling you, there's not a prettier sound than waking up in the morning to the beauty of a hundred Mandarin voices praying and worshiping God. The only word you could understand was Alleluia every few seconds. And we're just teaching them and training them and we're walking through scripture and we're teaching them stuff. But I got a little consternation and so far I thought that no one, no one was listening to me. And so I'm just teaching all this Bible, but the only thing you see when you're teaching the Bible in China is this. Now you know they're writing, but this is all you see the whole time. They never even look up at you. They're just doing this the whole time. And I'm a little worried because it's like I worked hard on this lesson. I really want these guys to get this. You know what I'm saying? And I finally go to the chief missionary and says, I don't think anybody's listening. 
And he says, they're listening more than you know. I says, what do you mean? They never look at me. He says, the Bible here is precious. And you could be beaten just for having a Bible. You can be arrested just for having a Bible. So Ricky, what every pastor here is doing is memorizing everything about the Bible that you say. And what's gonna happen over the next several days is they're gonna completely put it to memory. They're gonna throw away and burn these notes so that they don't have it in their hands. They will have it in their hearts because the word of God is precious. God told me to tell you that what he has given you is a valuable commodity and to hold Hold on to God's word. Can you say amen? amen? He says, pay attention to the word. It's prosecco. Prosecco, the prefix pros means towards. Echo means to have or to hold. So the whole idea is that Peter is saying, you got to move towards God's word and learn what it means to hold on to the truth no matter what dark forces in culture or how the evil one tries to take it away from you. Lean into God's word and hold on to the truth. Satan, aptly dressed in a red hoodie, will always try to twist God's word and to make you think that the word of God is saying something else that it does not. You'll have seasons where the workplace, Satan is using that as a foothold to steal the truth. Your marriage gets on tumultuous times, and Satan tries to use that wedge to steal away God's word, but the Christian has to be committed that the book may get me in trouble, but the book is the only thing that's going to get me out of trouble, and no matter what Satan tries to do, Satan, you can't snatch God's truth from me. I'm going to stand on the word of God. Get out of here, Satan. Y'all give it up for Hunter. He's going to be a great pastor someday. So in closing, the word of God is enlightening, meaning um, he says it's a, a lamp shining in a dark place, meaning that the word of God exposes truth that our hearts may not be open to. Have you ever read the Bible? It's been like three months since you read, but you're in trouble. How many know when you're in trouble, all of a sudden, you're a wonderful student of God's word? And everybody said, amen. amen. Oh, well, I wish I could read in peacetime like I read in wartime. Can I get an amen right there? When I'm at wartime, me and this book, man, I'm telling you, it's all day, every day. But th have you ever gone to the Word and all of a sudden you're like, oh, yeah, that's right. 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 Or, oops, that's the power of God's Word. Imagine, though, if you read it enough to have it in you, that when you're facing those situations, you see, when you're in trouble and you get pressed, the only thing that can come out is what's in you. And imagine having God's word in you when you go through those cruxes of life. Come on, somebody. Is there a Bible reader that's going to say amen? You got to have it in you. Don't hear me say you got to know all the Greek and all the Aramaic and all the Hebrew and know everything about it. Just say that the word is a lamp to my feet, Psalm 119, and a light to your path. It gives exposure to what God wants you to do in tough times. I just bought a new car. And... Uh, no, it's not a Corvette. <laughs> April said no. And uh, it's not a new car, it's a new used car. And it's a hybrid, and I like my little car. It's really cool, okay? It's the slowest car I've ever bought. Anyway, I, I, I like my little car. It's just like, man, saving gas is going to take some time. Anyways, um, and I don't like reading instructions because I feel like the manufacturer ought to make things intuitive for me. Ain't, no, ain't nobody got time for all that. You know what I'm saying? It's got a steering wheel, got brakes, it's got my stereo. I got all that I need. But one day I had to reach in the glove compartment because I needed some sunglasses and I saw something called a driver's manual. And I decided just, you know what? And I bought it going. And, and y'all, I started reading it and it amazed me that there were some options that came with my car right. that I never even knew were available to me because I, you get it sooner, I'll preach my shorter. That some options became available that I didn't know I had. Here's the result. I was already diamond in the back, sunroof top, yeah. digging the scene with the yeah. gangster lean. But, but now I know <laughs> I got seat warmers. <laughs> Amen, somebody. I've got something called Apple CarPlay. There's just options that came available, and as such, my ride is more enjoyable. God says there are options that this book has for you that you haven't even considered or made, your, made available to your life. Get in God's Word. Amen.
Word of God is precious. Word of God is enlightening. And let's go home with this. The Word of God is powerful. Yeah. Word of God is powerful. Man, I wish I had time to preach this like it deserves, but I don't. So it is what it is. Notice he says um, how this word of prophecy did not come from someone's own interpretation, but men, okay, God spoke to men, key phraseology now, they were carried along by the Holy Spirit. Now, Peter here is alluding to what we call the doctrine of inspiration, which says that God himself partnered with mankind to write his book, i.e., this is Peter. It's Peter's grammar. It's Peter's language. It's Peter's thinking. It's Peter's perspective of how he experienced events. He, God is using all of that, but the Bible says they were carried along. Translation, the Holy Spirit, here's the, here's the word in scholarship, the Holy Spirit superintended the process. Where they, Even though it was them and it was their voice and it was their grammar, the Holy Spirit came upon that thing. So, uh, Second Timothy, Paul says, it, God breathed it through them. The whole idea is that the Holy Spirit never let it get outside of the will and purposes of God. This is why the Bible is still the bestseller, because the Holy Spirit carried them along. This is why no matter how wicked a government gets and tries to burn our book, this is still why we got a book, because the Holy Spirit carried it along. This is why, even though it feels like there are seasons where the Bible has seasons in and out of popularity, it never endures seasons in and out of rev re relevance because the Holy Spirit carried it along. Ricky, what do you want the take home to be? Here it is. This book has power. The Lord is my shepherd, I shall not walk. He maketh me to lie down in green pastures. He leadeth me beside the still waters. Yea, though I walk through the valley of the shadow of death, I will fear no evil, for thou art with me, thy rod and thy staff. They comfort me. Surely goodness and mercy shall follow me all the days of my life, and I shall dwell in the house of the Lord forever. Never have I seen the righteous forsaken, nor his seed begging bread. But they that wait upon the Lord shall renew their strength. They shall mount up on wings as eagles. They shall run and not get weary. They shall walk and not faint. And we know that all things work together for good to them that love God, to those who are called according to his purposes. For if you abide in me and my words abide in you, you can ask what you will and it shall be given unto you. Get this word in your heart because there's power in the word of God. Uh, Charles Spurgeon, 1857, has to preach at a place called the Crystal Palace. I think we have a picture of it. And that afternoon, he would preach to 23,600 people. But there's no loudspeakers. So he's got to go into this empty cathedral and he's got to practice the acoustics. And he decides, he goes in this empty church and nobody's in there. And he's a Brit, right? So he's just walking the stage and he decides to quote John 129 over and over again. So I'm going to try my British impersonation right now. Okay. So it's over and over, empty building. Uh, behold, the Lamb of God which taketh away the sins of the world. Uh, behold, jolly good, the Lamb of God which taketh away the sins of the world. Behold, behold the Lamb of God which taketh away the sins. He's just testing the acoustic. Behold the Lamb of God which... I'm getting a little better. It's like, behold the Lamb of God which taketh away the sins of the world. And he's just testing out the acoustics. History tells us that there was a custodian up in one of the galleries upstairs sweeping his broom, listening to this crazy Brit say, Behold the Lamb of God, which taketh away the sins of the world. And years later, on his deathbed, his family asked this custodian, how did this whole Christianity thing start anyways? And he said, it was 1857. And I was just pushing my broom. And Spurgeon was practicing on his sermon, and he kept saying, Behold the Lamb of God, which taketh away the sins of the world. And I dropped my broom, and the conviction of the Spirit came over me, and I gave my heart and life to Jesus sometime thereafter, because that man kept saying that one verse. If one verse did this for one janitor, how much more will the whole book do for you? No guilt, no shame, 
but I'm begging you, read the book. It's not that he's not talking. It's that we are not reading. So let us read the word of God. Prayer will be available in the back. If you want a relationship with Jesus, we'd love to tell you how. Until we meet again, you open up your hands like this. Thanks for being awesome, and thanks for being a Bible church. Hold the faith. Keep the faith. Stay in Christ. And until we meet again, the Lord bless you and keep you. The Lord make his face to shine upon you and to be gracious to you. And may the Lord lift up the light of his countenance upon each and every one of you and bring you peace. And we pray this blessing in the name of the Father and of the Son and the Holy Spirit. Amen. 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 Y'all have a great week. God bless you.